says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Worship his holy name.
Well, good morning, everybody. Well, it's a grace and peace to you on this Lord's Day. It's a joy to see all of you this morning. So glad that you've come today for our hour of worship. I am Jim Hoffman. I have the privilege of being the pastor here at St. John's, the privilege of welcoming you today. On the chancel with me this morning are Allie Cobb, who is our director of children's and youth and family ministry, Dale Morehouse, our wonderful accompanist and choir director. All of our choir members back there, you all know all of them. I couldn't name them all. I do know them all, by the way. We're a joy to have them. And of course, Nikki Lerner, as well as her husband, David, and their pianist, Stephen, are with us today as well. Uh, we are so pleased that you are, have gathered with us for this hour of worship. It is a joy to have you this morning. For those of you that are online, we welcome you today as well. We are so glad that you have joined with us also. I'm going to encourage all of you to take a quick moment to just let us know that you're present, so you can do that a couple of different ways. For those of you here this morning, there's a little black attendance book. If you would just simply sign in and let us know that you are here, we would be grateful and appreciate you doing that. For those of you who are new here, we have little welcome cards that are in your row as well. and You can certainly use that. You can leave that in our offering plate at the end of the worship service. For you at home, if you would just simply leave us a comment on Christian World Media or on Facebook, let us know you're here. We'd appreciate you doing that. Or if you got the email this morning, you can sign in through it as well. As you came in, you should have received one of our worship guides. Everything that you need to participate in our order of worship is contained herein. For you at home, you got it through your email this morning, or you can access that at our website for our church as well. Uh, take an opportunity to look through it, and then take a moment to also look at our invitations for this week. Lots of different things that are transpiring in the life of your church. We want to remind you of these things. After worship, don't forget to take a few moments to come and join us for some fellowship. The youth are selling their donuts today, so those are available in the rotunda. For those of you who have dieted all week long for this moment, your time has come. You can have a donut today, so come and join us right after worship is over. Uh, don't forget, this is also Children's Monthly Matinee today as well, so the kids will be gathering downstairs for the monthly matinee. If you ordered nuts um, for baking for the holidays, Dennis and Annette have those today, and so you can uh, find them. Uh, they're actually handing them out out of their trunk in the front part of the church, so that's where you will go. It's a secret, but go there, all right? That's where you pick those up from today. And then take a moment to read through our invitations for outreach as well. We're coming to that time of the year where winter clothes are needed for our baby grace closet, and so look at that note on page 17. And don't forget, it's turkey time as well. We want to get that big trophy back and be the most foul congregation. So at the bottom of page 17, you'll see how you can participate in that with us. Again, all other, uh, there's all kinds of other pieces of information in here and invitations. Take a moment to read through those. They are all for you. And, and today we are going to continue our worship series titled Tribal, and we're going to talk about what it means for us to be tribal sometimes in our ethnicity, in our groups in which we find ourselves in. Hopefully we can break through some of that today for us, that we might be a more inclusive community, um, particularly as God's community. So looking forward to that conversation with you today. As we continue in worship this morning, though, I want to invite you to turn now to page number four and five. This is our opening hymn today. It is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, and it is United Methodist hymn number 133. As you are able, I'd invite you to stand and let's sing together, friends. <laughs> Oh, 
morning. Good morning. I'm Allie Cobb, Director of Children's Youth and Family Ministries, and our call to worship this morning can be found on page five of your worship guide. We gather as many individuals, yet, yet we are one body. body. We come from many places, yet, yet we come to one place. We gather as God's many children, yet, yet we are one church. We are we all are one body in this place, place as, as God's church. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is on page six of your worship guide. It is, Oh, How He Loves You and Me. It is from the faith we sing, number 2108. <laughs> now time for children's moments. So children and children at heart, this moment is for you. So I've done a few children's moments in my time, and some weeks they're easier than others. Some weeks they're a little bit harder. Um, I still don't forgive you for the week with demons and pigs, by the way. That one I'm still um, a little bitter about. But anyway, so some weeks it's easier to come up with children's moments than others, and I try and make sure that my children's moments kind of fit in with what Jim's gonna talk to the grown-ups about. So like I said, sometimes it's easier than others. And this week we have a special guest with us, Miss Nikki, who's right there for those children that have walked in a little bit later. So I was trying to think of a good way to kind of tie in Jim's series right now with our guest, Miss Nikki, this morning. So Jim is talking about tribal right now, which kind of means like a group or a community. And I was thinking about Miss Nikki, and Miss Nikki, wouldn't you guys agree that she is really good at singing? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start my children's moment negative, but it's going to end on a positive, okay, folks? So just follow me with this. Think of something that you are really, really not good at. I'll go first. I have told Jim on a Sunday I will help him with whatever he needs except for singing. <laughs> If Dale is sick or the soloist is out, I quit. I will not tell whatsoever. I make sure my mic is not on. I do a lot of lip syncing. That is not where my talents lie, and I know this. You do not want to hear Miss Allie sing. It is just not something I am good at in my life. No, I'm not. <laughs> I could really list the things that I am not good at, but I will just limit that to singing this morning. Can anybody think of something that they are not good at? Could somebody name something that they are not good at? What? Singing? Okay, okay, we have a few singers out there. Any of my children want to think of something that they might not be good at? Drawing. There you go. Okay, you're not good at drawing. Anybody else have something that they're not good at? Computers. Okay, so we, I have some children at heart that are not good at computers. Anybody else? What? Admitting when you're wrong. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> okay, so is there anybody out there this morning who is good at drawing? Is there anybody out here this morning that is good at drawing? Okay, so we have somebody that's not good at drawing, but we have some people that are good at drawing. We have some people that aren't good with computers. Is anybody good with computers? 
Okay, there you go. I'm personally good at online shopping, so if you guys ever need help with that, that is something I'm good with. Yeah, 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 that counts as a check mark in my list. Okay, okay, and then admitting when you're wrong. Is anybody out here good at admitting when they're not wrong or not right? One of the, okay. We'll, we'll all work on that together. Okay, <laughs> so it's easy for us to sometimes get jealous when we see somebody that's really good at something that we're really not. It would be very easy for me to be jealous of my new friend, Miss Nikki, because she's very talented and very nice. And it would be easy for me to get a little jealous. Same way with our choir. They are so gifted and so talented each week. I just sit over there going, the whole note is the one that looks like the O. Like, I am just so not good at music, and I am just in awe of how good they are each and every week. But here's the thing. When we invite people into our group or into our community or into our tribe that's better at things than us, it kind of makes us a little bit better too. God made each and every one of us different for a reason. It would be so boring if we were all the same and we were all good at the same things. I wouldn't want to hang out with those people. I know, right, Daniel? You don't want to hang out with those people, do you? I know. He's really good at um, knowing what dinosaurs are. Okay, there you go. Okay, sorry. Okay, we're good. Okay, yeah. He's very smart at knowing languages already, folks. <laughs> yes. So when we invite people into our group or into our tribe that are not like us, it helps make us better and more loving towards one another. So as you go forth in everything, try and find those people out there that are better at things than you are, because it will help make all of our tribes and communities just a little bit better. Let us bow our heads and pray. Dear God, thank you for all making us uniquely different with different talents from you. Help us to love one another's gifts to make our community or tribe more loving and diverse. In your name we pray, amen. It is now time for our children's Sunday school, so any children who would like to join me, we will be cooking for neighbor to neighbor, and I will meet you all in the back. On page seven, you're going to see our joys and our concerns for today, and I want to draw your attention there for our time of meditation and prayer. Uh, a couple of things just to uh, point towards your attention. Uh, first, we want to say, say thank you to Barbara Meyer. She is the one that provided our donuts for the youth today, so thank you very much, Barbara, for that. Under our concerns, if you didn't read your email yesterday, um, we announced yesterday the death of Dennis Hudson passed away on Friday afternoon, so if you would be in prayer for Carol and her family as they gather, we have not yet uh, had an opportunity to discuss arrangements or anything like that. Once we do, we will make sure you as a community know that so that you might gather around the family. For those of you who do not know this, Dennis was a child at Brookside Methodist Church that became St. John's United Methodist. So he is one of our children that grew up in this church, is one of our longest-term members. He and, he and Dick Jensen were both kids at this church. So be in prayer for their family, if you would, please. Continue to also pray for those that are on our prayer list. These are family, friends, and acquaintances of ours. They are folks who have needs of body, mind, and spirit. And so we pray that you will also lift these up in your time of prayer today and your time of daily prayer each day. Let us come now before the, the presence of God and let us take a moment to now pause and meditate and pray as we lift up our own prayers. In a few moments, I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer. We'll pause if there's a name that you would like to share. We'll give you a moment to speak that name out loud so all might hear and pray for that person today. And then I invite you to join with me as we close together in the Lord's Prayer, which you will see at the bottom of page 7 in your worship guide. Let us now pause and let us pray.
oh glorious God, it is a beautiful, it is a wonderful day for us to gather as your people in our communities and our houses of worship today. If we look around our lives and we look around the landscape as, as nature's changing before us, we, we see ample reasons to praise your holy name today, to give you thanks for all the goodness that we inhabit and experience, to lift our praises to you for health and life and another day that we might experience your goodness but also might experience our family, our friends, for this moment where we can gather as a church, where we can proclaim that you are our Savior, you are our Redeemer, you are the one who sustains us each and every day, where we can take a moment to also see around us how blessed we truly are. Help us not to take these things for granted, but rather to, to count our blessings each and every day and to be mindful of these things and to also be reminded that we are simple stewards. You've placed them in our trust and you entrust us with much. We know that someday we will be accountable for these things. And so we ask that you give us the power of your spirit today, that we might live into these blessings, that we might use them not just for our own benefits, but for the benefit of the world and the common good around us. Teach us what it means to be as generous as you have been generous to us, what it means for us to live in sacrificial love for one another and the world beyond, because you have sacrificed in love for us. Teach us what it means to see all your people. It is easy for us sometimes to be myopic, to focus in on our own little set of concerns and needs or, or the small group that we're a part of and our needs and our concerns. And then when we look around the world, we might see that in some way these things are insignificant. Help us to, to have a broader view of your world, O oh Lord. The concerns that are before us as a race, as a people. Help us to be in tune with those things as much as we are our own self and needs. And give us the power of your spirit that we might be active agents on your behalf, that we might bring goodness and wholeness and the message of your love that is redeeming and that is recreating so that there might be hope in this world. More hope than what we catch through the news or other media. We are alive in you because your spirit has come to be in us. And so enliven us for your glorious purposes and your mission. Enliven us to live each and every day for you in ways that will be meaningful for the common good in the world around us. Hear our prayers this day. As we lift up those that are in our community that mourn today, we pray for Carol and her family as they mourn the death of Dennis. We pray for others who might not have been named or that we do not know yet, but, but are part of our community that might have illnesses or, or might have other concerns, and we lift them up to you today. And those that are known to us, that are on our prayer list. Oh God, in each of these circumstances, may your presence dwell with them. May your healing hand come, and may your will be done in their lives. We pray for these and many others today. In our prayers, oh God, we ask that you hear us. But just as importantly, Give us ears to hear you today as you speak. And now we pause to lift up any names that might be upon our hearts and minds that we wish to share now in this moment of prayer. All these things we pray in the name of your Son, who is our Lord and Savior, and the one who taught his disciples to pray, say, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The setting of Psalm 23.
let my cup overflow with more of you. Um, Paul in the first Corinthians in, had just gotten through writing about the Lord's Supper and that cup. He was speaking uh, to a world that it was going to be and already had been many tribes. And we're living in a world of a lot of tribes. Even when we say good morning, bon matin, good morning, good morning, 140 languages perhaps today are worshiping Christ as tribes and one body. With that in mind, Paul in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, starting with the 12th verse, um, we have it in your, on page 9 in the Common English Bible. One tribe uh, rendition I would like to use is my um, good buddy here, the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, if you will allow me, indulge me to read that passage. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we all were baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of that one spirit he had just written about, about the Lord's Supper. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So if the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the air, ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. Now, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. So the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor a head, again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, given the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, let's face it, all suffer with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now, today, he is saying, you, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Hmm. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Garth. So you all know a couple weekends ago was Halloween, right? Any of you have kids come by and trick-or-treat at your house? A few here and there, right? Uh, I was um, listening to the radio on Monday morning afterwards, and I was listening to Dana Wright and Scott Parks' show. Most of you here in Kansas City are probably familiar with their radio program. They caught my attention when they started talking about a tweet that was posted early Monday morning. And this is the best that I could replicate what they were sharing. This is what was tweeted out. I've noticed in the past several years that the demographic of people who trick-or-treat at my door are changing. I live in a fairly affluent part of town, not Mission Hills, but nice enough, and I know most of my neighbors. The people who pulled up on my block letting their kids out to trick-or-treat do not appear to be from my neighborhood. It's pretty evident because their cars that they are driving are in rough shape and not very well maintained. I thought the idea of living in a neighborhood was to be a part of that neighborhood. I don't mind the kids of my neighborhood coming to trick or treat at my door. I wish that others would take advantage of trick or treating in their own neighborhood. And then this person puts in, I'm not a racist. I just think people should stick to their own neighborhoods. I've read somewhere that you should not assign intentions to people that you can't verify, but I'm going to violate that for a moment, if you don't mind, right? Because her tweet comes across as someone who fears something unsavory happening because of outsiders. She simply reminds us of this world that we live in that is us and them, our tribes. When Margaret and I moved to Brookside about eight and a half years ago, we, we experienced this, right? We came from the suburbs, and, and in the suburbs, it's a little bit closer kind of community. It, it's a little more homogeneous in the community as well. It's a lot different. We were accustomed to the suburbs, and then we moved to the Brookside area, and that demographic changed. And our first Halloween, we had people of all sorts come by our house, people that lived in our neighborhood, people that didn't live in our neighborhood. Now, you might recall a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, uh, I was out on the front porch. It was a nice enough evening for Halloween, so I decided to just kind of park myself out on our front, front porch. And I was handing out candy to all these kids that were coming up in their cute little costumes and everything like that. And I'd just hold the bowl out, and I'd say, you know, take a piece or two. Your choice, right? Take your own choice. As the evening began to wind down, three teenage boys came up on our steps. One of them looked into the bowl, took a couple of pieces of candy, Another one looked at the bowl and grabbed the whole thing out of my hand and just ran with it. Now, did that upset me? Yes. I'm human, right? I haven't ascended any further than the rest of us. I'm human. Now, did it cause me to quit giving out candy? No, I handed out candy this year. Of course, I kept the bowl under my arm like this and went like that as people came up. <laughs> Did it create in me a racial division because that young man was a different race than me? No. He was a teenager. And teenagers do stupid things, right? Now, if you would spend an hour with some of my youth group friends that I grew up with, you would know that to be true because they could tell all kinds of stories I don't want any of you to know about right? Because I was a teenager, I did some pretty dumb things. Now, I imagined on that Monday morning that Dana Wright was probably standing on her chair yelling into the microphone. She was so worked up that morning. But once she climbed off her chair, she told a story about what it meant for her to trick-or-treat as a child. She grew up in West Topeka. and She said in that time, in that age, West Topeka was a very rough neighborhood. And so every year, her mom would pack up her and her siblings in the station wagon, and they'd drive to a different part, a nicer part of Topeka, and she would let them out so that they might go and trick-or-treat at homes where she felt they would be safe. Dana's assumption was that some folk don't trick-or-treat in their own neighborhood 
because it isn't safe for them to trick-or-treat in their own neighborhood. They'd just rather take their kids to a better part of town so that they could just join in with other kids, having some fun for a couple of hours, collecting candy from nice, generous people. Regardless. Regardless. Now, if you pause with me for a moment, this might remind you, as it does me, that if there's anything that's still apparent and prevalent in our society, it is that we continue to be divided by a number of things, friends. We are stuck in our tribes. And some of those tribes are defined by race. Once upon a time, I, I was able to lay my hands on the original platting and the covenants and restrictions for our neighborhood, for Ramanelli West, right? It showed Lot A. Lot A is this big old parcel right here that J.C. Nichols sold to the church so that we could put in a new building and establish a church on Ward Parkway. Lots B and C are the two houses right back here. And, and in the covenants and restriction, it said that the church had the opportunity to buy those houses if it wanted to and to use them for its own purposes. But then you get a little further into Nichols' covenants and restrictions. In the 1950s, as houses were being built in this community, you could not buy a house here if you were Jewish or black. But you know, Nichols wasn't the only one that demonstrated how divided we were as a community and continue to be some of our tribalism. If you didn't know this, there's a website that you can read about the history of Troost Avenue here in Kansas City, Missouri. It's a website titled www.prayontruth, and it's P-R-A-Y, not P-R-E-Y, just in case, all right? But Pray on Truth. Truth is 10.7 miles long. It runs north and south. We all know this. And it has a long history of being the red line that divides our city economically and, yes, racially. In its history, it goes back to the 1700s. And in the 1700s, Truth was actually a canoe path that the Osage Nation used to maneuver their canoes north and south towards the river. In the early 1800s, there was a 365-acre slave plantation that was east of Troost, and most of the slave labor on that plantation cleared the forest to the west so that Millionaire's Row could be built. In the 1900s, redlining became a common practice in our community, affecting housing, economics, public schools, quality of education, all these things. This divide had its effects and I think in many ways continues to have its effects on our community. But you know, there's more that we, we can talk about in this moment that shows how unequal we are, how devastatingly unequal we are as a world. You say names like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, and a score of other names that are heard and, and not even known to many of us. And because of violence in our world, you see the ways in which we live in these tribes. How divided we have become. I don't know if you've ever seen this bumper sticker. I remember seeing this bumper sticker a, a few times. And the bumper sticker reads simply this. There is only one race the human race. How sad it is, though, that that's a mere platitude, that we have not figured out how to make a reality. Socially, we have not learned how to live into a scientific fact. Some of us know, and, and we feel, the impact of our tribalism and what it means for our community and our neighborhood, but but, you know, we may not necessarily pay attention to that impact in how we gather as church communities. I'm going to assume that, that many of us are familiar with Martin Luther King Jr.'s words when he is noted as saying that 11 o'clock on Sunday is the most segregated hour of the week, right? And it still continues to be. Honestly, folks, of the hundreds, if not thousands, of churches here in the greater Kansas City metro area, there are very few of us who have figured out how to bridge the divide to become interracial, multicultural. The vast majority of us reflect our racial tribe. 
And we're okay with that in some way. But Paul had an important word for us today. He wanted to remind us that in our little tribes, we are not the summation of all things. Instead, there's a greater reality that we need to be aware of, and we need to try to figure out how to live into. As uh, as Garth read, you know, when you think about the, the letter that Paul's writing to the first Corinthians, they had this particular issue of power and status and wealth and all these kinds of things. But But one of the other things that they had was they had this recognition of their spiritual gifts. Some of them had the gifts of prophecy. Some of them had the gifts of tongue. Some of them had the the gifts of mercy and love and other things. And and what they found out was some of them were promoting their own gifts above other people. So the people that could speak in tongues thought they had the premier gift and it was above everybody else in the community. And they could literally do without anybody else in the community. They could relegate them to almost non-existence. And yet Paul reminds them that, that just because you have a spiritual gift does not mean that your gift is any greater than anybody else's gift. It serves a purpose in the church, in the community. And all of these gifts are given by the one Spirit, the one God, for the purposes of the church, the edification and the building up of the body. And so as they tried to negate one another, Paul tried to lift them all up. Actually, Paul reversed the order on them and told them, if anything, those of you who think you're too much, you ought to be at the bottom of all things. They had segregated into these little tribes in the church. And Paul wanted to remind them of one simple fact. You are no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. That in Christ Jesus, we are all equal. In the one spirit, we are all gifted. That is not just for the small body of Christ in church, in Corinth, but for the universal body of Christ in the world beyond. And as I think of us as a a community, yes, we are are who we are here at St. John. If you think about the demographics around our church, dear friends, and if you do any kind of demographic study, you'll know that 99.9% of this community is predominantly white. Very little diversity lives within three miles of our church. And that's natural for us to be able to get into this kind of of group and and to find ourselves maybe a little tribal in this. But it doesn't mean that as a church we can't be involved in things that move us to be an expression of the full body of Christ, to live into that expression of the full body of Christ. To be people who cross the divides for the greater purposes of God. I've mentioned to you before that I'm reading Richard Haight's book titled The Righteous Mind. He's the the one I told you that coined the idea of groupishness, and how we humans are groupish in some ways, right? At the time of his publishing in 2012, he was teaching moral psychology at the University of Virginia. And in one point of his book, he tells this story. He says, on the campus of the University of Virginia, there are various tribes, as in any university, right? There are various tribes on campus. You got your fraternities, you got your sorority, you got your clubs, your groups, your schools, your departments, all these little tribes coexisting on the campus. You've got your arm of the school that's involved with recruiting new students. You've got your arm of the school that's involved with the alumni as well. Small factions, small tribes, all within this larger ecosystem of the university. And most of the time, these small little tribes and factions are all doing things that serve primarily themselves and their little needs and their little community. And secondarily, hopefully, the university. But on Saturdays in the fall comes a tribal ritual at most of our student education institutions. At UVA on Saturday mornings, the students dress in these special costumes. The young men wear dress shirts with a UVA necktie, and if the weather is warm enough, they wear shorts with it. The young women typically wear skirts and dresses, often with pearl necklaces. The students gather around together and they do face painting of the UVA Cavaliers logo on their faces and other body parts that are visual. And then they have pre-game parties where they have brunch and some booze. It's a university. 
And then they stream over to the stadium afterwards, sometimes stopping to mingle with friends and relatives and, and other unknown alumni who've traveled into Charlottesville to tailgate, and they have parties before the game, and they have more food, and they have more drink, and they have more face painting. And when game time comes, there's as many as 50,000 people in their stand, a lot of them under the influence. But they're having fun. They join together in the synchronous chants and the cheers and the jeers and the songs that fill the stadium for the next three hours. When the Cavaliers score, the students lock arm in arm and they sway back and forth as a single mass and they sing the good old song of Wahoo Wah to the tune of Old Ang Zan. And during those three hours, the tribe does not care about your status, your gender, your politics, or your race. For on that day, in that three-hour period, they are all one under the banner of UVA. What would it mean for us as the body of Christ to be all under one banner of Jesus Christ, who is Lord and Savior? To break down the walls and the barriers that divide us into our little singular units, our small little tribe. If you struggle with that, I'm going to invite you to get involved with something that's going to cross the boundaries for you, that's going to break you out of your world a little bit. You can volunteer here, either at Baby Grace or Neighbor to Neighbor, and you're going to get a touch of that. You're going to get a lot of a touch of that. But there's other things around our community. Other ways in which we as God's people can serve and be reminded that we are part of the universal body of Christ and remind others that they are part of this body as well. I think it's time for us to look past maybe the limiting nature of our tribes so that we might be able to see that we truly are one human race. Would you pray with me? So God of all people and nations, sometimes we don't know how to act when what we love is threatened, when our beautiful, fragile, diverse world is in danger of being destroyed. We want justice, justice now. We wish you would forget mercy for a while, God, and just help us clean up this mess. But then we realize that we too are complicit in things that harm your hopes for us and your creation. And suddenly mercy looks a lot better. May we realize today that in your cosmic economy there is no other at all. There is only us. So we pray that you bless the others among us and near us. For in their genuine well-being, we will find our well-being as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that many of us, we have come not only to give ourselves today in heart and song, we have come to give our gifts today. As we gather as a community, thank you so much for your faithful and loving and generous <laughs> gifts. As you leave today, we have an offering plate that's at the back. Just simply leave your gifts there. But again, thank you so much for your faithfulness and your loving presence.
our hymn of sending forth this morning can be found on page number 11 of your worship guide. We're going to sing together, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, United Methodist Hymn number 526. Let us stand and let us sing together. <laughs> staying everybody <laughs> glad you're here <laughs> yeah, thank, you. thank you pastor <laughs> this song's about the holy spirit so receive this
before you in everything you do today. May you know he is leading you somewhere. And may you respond to him in joy. It's good to be together today. God bless.